coincide with the location of Buddhist sites. Kosavli's book, The Culture and Civilization of Ancient India, has a superbly telling photograph of pack animals carrying goods down the descent from the ghats to the coast, a picture that has not changed much in the narrower gullies of the ghats. And controlling both coasts of the Deccan was the ambition of many kingdoms of the peninsula as this would have given them a tremendous advantage in access to the West Asian trade across the Arabian Sea and the Southeast Asian trade across the Bay of Bengal. Kusambi had linked the rock-cut cave sites of the Western Deccan, Nasik, Junar, Karli, and so on, with this trade, and was proved to be right when the evidence for the trade increased and the links between traders and Buddhist monasteries came to be more closely established. He was interested in the activities of Buddhist monks and lay followers, as suggested by his father's work on Pali sources. That there was the direct participation of many monks in the trade is becoming apparent from recent studies of the early Buddhist texts and more so from the votive inscriptions recording donations at these monastic sites. The monasteries, therefore, were not just staging points for travelers on a long journey, but some could even have been the nuclei of commercial activity. Guilds of artisans, merchants, small-scale landowners, and some royalty were donors, as were members of the Sangha, monks and nuns, and incidentally, the donations of the nuns are really quite substantial. The cave monasteries of the Western Ghats are replete with inscriptions recording another kind of nexus, which is also very interesting. Guilds of craftsmen received endowments from royalty, one link. The interest of these endowments was used for the welfare of the monks, a second link. The reorientation of the economic aspects of institutions such as monasteries controlled later, uh, continued later with temples, same sort of arrangements, and provides additional dimensions to religious activities. Above all, this was a form of integration that had not been studied previously in the history of religion in India. The question of trade and urban growth enters into another aspect of Kosambi's view of Indian history, namely the question of whether India experienced a feudal period, and if so, what form did it take? Kosambi's focus was not so much on the general nature of feudalism, feudalism as formulated had little Europe. relationship with Indian historical evidence. The supposed absence of private property in land and consequently a static agrarian economy, as well as the infrequency of commerce with a focus on cities, was not supported by Indian sources the Asiatic mode of production was generally discounted. Marx had formulated the dialectic for European history based on various stage stages of change in the means of production. Of these, the slave and the feudal modes of production were thought of as possibly relevant for the history of early India. An attempt was made by S. A. Dange, a member of the then Communist Party of India, in his book entitled From Primitive Communism to Slavery, to put forward the idea of a slave-based economy for the ancient past. Kosambi's scathing criticism of the book pointed out the flaws in the use of sources and those that followed from, from conforming mechanically to a given view of what was thought to be the historical materialism of Marx. Attempting to fit the evidence to a particular framework showed a lack of analytical thinking. 
and for Kosambi, analytical thinking was a primary requirement, especially in considering variant forms within a Marxist framework. Slaves are, of course, mentioned in Indian sources, but these were largely domestic slaves and were not the primary providers of labor. The large-scale use of slaves in agricultural and craft production, as in some Greco-Roman economies, was replaced in India largely by shudra labor, and shudras were not slaves. Kosambi did not find a resemblance to slavery for production in the Indian situation, but he suggested that the Greek institution of helots, not found extensively in Europe, could nevertheless provide a parallel. Helots, <clears throat> helots were a community of families enslaved collectively as a group. They had military obligations and provided a fixed tribute to the city-state of Sparta, where the system of helots prevailed. The category of slavery was, of course, different. It applied to individuals who came from diverse communities and locations, but had a common function as unfree labor and were privately and individually owned as chattel slaves. So the two systems are quite distinct. The Shudra Varn, according to the Dharma Shastra texts, consisted of communities that provided labor, generally in the form of cultivators and artisans. But the cultivator was always kept unarmed, and we know this from Indian sources as well as Greek sources, and had no military obligations. Where he was cultivating state-owned land, he paid a tax to the state. Even the equation of Shudra with Helot could therefore at best have been a limited application. In the period subsequent to the Vedic, the social role of the Shudra caste was diversified, and dynasties such as the Nandas and the Mauryas, disapproved of in the Puranic sources, were identified by Puranic authors as Shudra. This would not fit in with the theory of helotage. Nevertheless, Kosambi's idea that the structure of caste society was such that it could demarcate a particular community to permanently providing labor becomes more evident with the Chandal and the untouchable as sources of labor. Kosambi argued for a feudal period of Indian history, dating its start to the later half of the first millennium AD, from about the 6th, 7th centuries onward, and continuing with variations into recent centuries. He saw it evolving in two phases, feudalism from above and feudalism from below. Feudalism from above was the initial phase when a powerful king ruling over lesser kings and chiefs received taxes from these lesser kings, who, even if politically subordinate, continued to control and administer their territories. Subsequent to this, there emerged feudalism from below. This was enhanced through a system of grants of revenue by the king, largely to religious beneficiaries. Initially, Buddhist Viharas, later on, individual Brahmins and the Agraharas and the Brahmadeyas, and then still later, temples. Um, and to a more limited extent, to the upper bureaucracy. There are a few cases of senior administrators also getting these grants. The grant related to specific lands, very carefully specified, the boundaries given in great detail. This created a body of intermediaries between the peasant and the king. They wielded power, particularly where the grant of revenue in perpetuity came to be treated as ownership of the land. Although the gifting of land and villages goes back to earlier times, in earlier times it was only occasional. <clears throat> 
The Mauryas, for instance, had crown lands, the Sita lands, established on wasteland and worked by Shudra cultivators. In the post-Gupta period, however, the period that Kosambi calls the beginning of feudalism, the granting of land by the king became a more regular administrative and economic pattern. The intermediaries between the peasant and the king could exploit the peasant and also nurture aspirations of setting up small estates as the nucleus of later kingdoms. And when one looks at the inscriptions of dynasties all over the subcontinent, this process becomes very, very clear. Many grants also gave judicial and administrative rights to the grantee, which freed him from both village administration and the calls of village administration, as well as responsibilities to the king. Where the grant of land was in forested areas, the tribes or clans could be converted into Shudra peasants. This was another and perhaps more common aspect of the mutation of tribe into caste or the change from clan-based society to a state system. The pattern is particularly noticeable in areas newly cleared of forests adjoining kingdoms or where kingdoms were established for the first time, as is clear from inscriptions recording these. The change is also evident from various other sources, as for example, the famous biography of Harshavardhana, the Harsha Charita of Bana Bhatta, who gives a very detailed account of this changed society. The system within which the change occurred was different in the post-Gupta period from the Mauryan when the state was hostile to the forest dwellers. Initially, the grant was only of the revenue from the land, but very soon the grantees assumed ownership of the land, especially where the grant was in perpetuity. Sons, grandsons, great-grandsons, and so on. This led to the grantees claiming superior status. And when they later established kingdoms, some of them, some claimed to be kshatriyas, irrespective of their actual caste origins. They underwent rituals that conferred this status on them and had genealogies composed to, conform, uh, to confirm this status. The question of whether or not there was an Indian version of feudalism has been debated for some years now. Some scholars have critiqued what they thought was too literal an application of the feudal mode of production. Others have argued that the Indian version did not conform to European feudalism given the absence of domain farming on a substantial scale on the land of the vassal by labor that was compulsory. This involves questions of European serfdom and the manorial system, as well as the contractual element in the relations between king, vassal, and serf. And these are different from Europe uh, as compared to India. It was also pointed out that neither trade nor cities had declined in major parts of the subcontinent as was the case in European feudalism. In pursuing these questions, other patterns have been suggested on the formation of states during this period and on the mutation of clans into castes, on the administration of agrarian economies and the interweaving of local religions with the more wide-ranging Vaishnava and Shaiva Puranic sectarian movements. Alternate reconstructions refer themselves largely to the early medieval period, namely from the 8th to the 13th centuries. They are not theories of explanation that follow from earlier functions and the changes that these brought. And that I would regard as one of the weaknesses of the more recent theories which is a weakness that can, that can certainly be corrected by more research. 
Kosambi's writing, then, as a paradigm shift, is evident in the questions that he asked of the sources and in his attempts to answer them. This required a rigorous analysis of event and person in a historical context, an analysis that extended beyond chronology and dynastic history to the social and economic mainsprings of societies and cultures. His explanations of the historical process made visible many areas of investigation that had not received attention previously and the kind of new questions that can be asked of the data. In the themes I have discussed, each touch on different aspects but are nevertheless interconnected. The discussion on the mutation of tribe into caste introduced a new dimension to the history of caste. More broadly, it registers the change from a pre-state society to state systems, from pre-class -pre to varying elements of class. Initiating discussion on Buddhist monasteries and commercial activities, Kosambi raised the issue of institutions of various religions also functioning as socio-economic institutions. They were not only in keep, these were not only in keeping with historical change, but often fostering particular directions of change conducive to the authority of religious orthodoxies. In his discussion of feudalism in India, we see a historian investigating many facets of society and not limiting himself to any single form of historical determinism, if at all there was any interest in any kind of determinism. Many of Kusambi's analyses are in substance valid, even 50 years later. Some naturally need reconsideration, either because of new evidence, and this is particularly the kind of evidence that's coming up from archaeology these days, or because of new theories of explanation, or because the overall perspectives of the past are today differently nuanced. His intellectual perspectives and sensitivities were inevitably of his own times. Up to a point, they carried traces of both the idealism and the dismissals of those times. Nevertheless, he insistently asserted his autonomy from the clutches of contemporary orthodoxy, both of the left and of the right. For him, the past was not a mechanism of political mobilization, as it has increasingly, increasingly become among, among, among many Indians today. The sources that inform us about the past have to be meticulously analyzed, irrespective of whether they are religious or non-religious. The reading of history has to be subjected to a rigorous methodology. The past has to be understood as what it was and what it is as part of our present. This will explain to us what was the past and what is the present. Mathematics and not history was his primary discipline. The mind of the mathematician is in some ways evident not only in his application of statistics to some data, but even more in the search for clarity in organizing the data and the logic of the argument. There were times when he was adamant in his views, but disagreement could also extend to debate, for even where there was disagreement, this in itself occasioned new thoughts and new ideas in the pursuit of a question. Rereading Kosambi, and he has to be read more than once, is to experience each time the thrill of being provoked into thinking historically. But at the same time, 
This thinking was not limited to the historical. It was enveloped by the perceptions of a firmly independent intellectual with a remarkably creative mind. Thank you. Artha, in ancient time, never happened. Like a five million soldiers was not possible to be killed in that time. How far you endorse this view? Uh, I don't think he said that the, that the Mahabharata never happened in that sense. Um, what many scholars have said, and he's not the only one, is that the Mahabharata is not the story literally of a series of, event, of events as narrated in the text. That there is a lot of fantasy, mythology, legend that goes into the covering, the fashioning, the designing of these events. Therefore, we cannot take these texts as literally having happened in the way in which they are described. Now, this is, uh, a, it applies not only to the Mahabharata, it applies to a lot of epic literature. It is in the nature of epics that you take a small narrative and you go on expanding it and expanding it and bringing in more from different sides and bringing it